It's Bill Leff with you on WGN. Let us now examine the story of Charlotte Parkhurst, the first woman to vote. But wait, there's a whole lot more. Karen Condation joins me. She is the author of the new book, Whip. Hello, Karen. How are you? Hey. Hi, Bill. Great to talk to you. Thank you. Same here. This is, what a story this is. How Can, can I ask, and, and we, we, of course, have not gone into detail yet about the story of uh, Charlotte Parkhurst, but how up on this story were you? Is this something you just found out and someday said, and one day said, I've got to write a book about it? What happened? I was in my 20s. Um, I remember I was uh, reading Cosmopolitan magazine, how to, yeah. how to Get a Man, <laughs> and all of a sudden there was this very interesting article about wild women of the old west and i thought wow i had never heard of a woman you know dressing as a man especially in the old west and why she would do that and you know how she would get away with it and you know in the old days those stagecoach drivers did everything together yep. like excuse me they even peed together yep. you know so yep. it was like how in god's name she <laughs> she carried this off so I was in my 20s, and she used to kind of, like, come in and out of my head, and I, it, she fascinated me. And so I thought it would be great to write a book about her someday. Well, flash forward many years. Um, my mom passed away, and I had a lot of feelings, and so I thought, why don't I use those feelings and dedicate the book to my mom? And so um, I sat down. It took six years and 27 drafts. Wow. <laughs> and, you know, and there it is. And I'm very grateful uh, that people are sort of taking it on um, and enjoying it. Um, why I would say the most important thing about the book is it's really a book about forgiveness. Yeah. All right. Well, well let's, I want the forgiveness part to pay off, but I want to get to know her a little bit more. Uh, Charlie Parkhurst, now at this point, we're going to the mid-1800s, mid to late 1800s. Born when, in 1812. Born in 1812, right. And in 1879. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and she was what around kind of, during the Civil War, except she was in California. Oh, she was. Okay. So what kind of a girl was she? What, what do we know about her childhood? Um, now, I'll tell you. I went to visit her grave in a place called Watsonville, California, which is near Santa Cruz on the way to San Francisco. Mm-hmm. And she's buried in a place called the Odd Fellow Cemetery. Mm, how appropriate, um, huh? The big charity group, a male charity group, and only men could join. Um, and she became a member of it. Um, they all thought she was a man, of course, until she... By the way, let me just say this. I'm going to answer your question about what kind of girl she was. But this is interesting that... Um, when they got her ready for her funeral, they couldn't believe it. The great, famous Charlie Parkhurst, this rock star, and stagecoach drivers were rock stars then. Yeah. The woman who had had a child. I mean, they did this autopsy. And doctors were running from San Francisco and everywhere to check her out. And they couldn't believe it. Um, in fact, in my book, there's a New York Times obituary that I found, a wonderful obituary about her. And in it, they I'm misquoting slightly, but they said that someday her story was so fabulous that someday someone should write a novel about ah, her. Somebody so did. did. <laughs> but to answer your question, to go back there, um, I went to Watsonville to see her grave, and there was a woman there who's now passed on. Um, and she knew more about Charlie Parker's than anyone. Um, I interviewed her, and, you know, I got all the facts that there are about her, and there's only really verified about four or five facts. Yeah. Um, And the rest of it, I, you know, she gave me some, she gave me some rumors about her. And I took the rumors, and I riffed on it. So that what I did was I took all the facts, and then I took the rumors, and I, you know, the book on the cover, it says, a novel inspired by a true story. Yep. So um, much of it is true, but much of it is based on rumor, and then I just created around it. See, I'm I'm okay with that. If you notice, almost any book or movie now says essentially those words, based on a true story, or, you know, they play with that just a little bit. 
I don't take it for gospel. I just say there's no, you know, this is a woman who lived in the mid-1800s. We can't possibly know everything exactly that happened, can we? Well, first of all, nobody even was interested in her because she was a famous stage. You know, there were a lot of famous stagecoach drivers. So why would she be any different than anyone else? And, well, it's because, of course, when she died, <laughs> she turned out to be a woman. Yep. There's... Um, so nobody paid attention to her any more than they did any other stagecoach driver. Yeah. They didn't take pictures of her. There were no photographs. She there blended were, in. There, there was one little sort of interview about her that we don't even know is true. You know, look, you know, when we talk about Billy the Kid or any of those people, you know, they've all become iconic sort of legends. Sure. Um, so who knows? Even Lincoln now, you know, we're having all this trouble now with, I guess, Stephen Spielberg is having trouble with people saying, oh, but this, you know, uh, this is not true and this isn't true. Well, unfortunately, for a writer, if you just write the truth, it's really boring. It will be really boring because you have to have an arc. I mean, they made a love story in it, which um, apparently maybe happened with a runaway slave. See, now with Lincoln, though, Karen, because I, I did you see you saw the movie, right? Which one? Lincoln. Did you see oh, that? Yes, of course. I know for a fact that Lincoln was not married to Gidget. They were messing with us a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> There's no way Lincoln and Gidget Ooh, hooked I up. I was warned you're funny. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Tell me this. Do you know, does anybody know, was there a time where, 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 uh, where, where Charlotte Parker just said, enough of this. I've lived as a girl for a while. I'm going to live as a guy. Was it, was it overnight? Was it gradual? Do we know? We don't know. So... Um, the story that I created, and I don't want to spoil it for anyone, but it's a, you know, it's out of revenge. <laughs> Excuse me, it's out of, um, it's out of... Somebody did her wrong. Somebody destroyed her family. Ugh. And so, and horribly. Oh. And so there is a question that runs through the book. The river that runs through the book is this question. And I want you to answer this, Bill. Sure. If someone destroyed horribly everyone that you love in this world yeah um could you forgive them no and if you couldn't forgive them how far would you go uh i would i would want to turn the tables on them i would not forgive them i would want to do the same injustice to them they did to me okay well that's exactly what she does yeah yeah she puts on men's clothes because of course in those days you couldn't a woman couldn't travel by herself um she, only men could and she was very good with horses. She, you know, she was a carriage driver. She knew backwards and forwards. Uh, so she got this job. In, she, she was born in the East Coast. And she went from Rhode Island to Boston to Boston to California around, you know, on a ship, um, which was none too easy to do in those days, a three-month grueling trip, um, and dressed as a man. And we know that as a fact. We even know the ship she was on. Um, got to California, you know, got this, this stagecoach job, with Wells, which eventually became Wells Fargo. It was a little tiny stagecoach company, and then they were bought up, eaten up, um, the little ones by Fargo, yeah. Wells Fargo. So eventually there she was. And in fact, when I was in San Francisco, I sat in a Wells Fargo stagecoach in the museum and did an interview with an NPR guy there. Hmm. It was great fun, and they have information about her there, uh, too. So she's, you know, she's kind of a, if people are interested in the West, she's kind of an iconic figure. But the other thing I want to say to people who are not interested in Westerns, this is not really, it is, yes, it's based in the Old West. Mm -hmm. And but and there's also I have to warn people there's bad language in it. Oh come on, I'm oh, out. I'm because, out. You know that's how they spoke. I mean, did you ever watch Deadwood? Yeah, every episode. I love it. Oh well, guess who read read the audio book? That would be Calamity Jane Robin Weigert. That's exactly right. Yep. And she was she is brilliant. Yeah, how could she not be? She's oh fantastic. my god, she's so amazing. Yeah. and it's a it's a great. I'm very proud of the audio book because of her. Yeah. You know? Um, but anyway, um, she said a few a few words, didn't she, on Deadwood? <laughs> Once or twice, yeah. 
once yeah. or twice. Um, <laughs> but anyway, you know, some, every once in a while I get somebody very shocked who writes and goes, oh, yeah, yeah there's too much violence and there's, nah. there's too many bad words in this book. And so, you know, I need to warn people before. Um, no warning for me, Karen. But how about this? Was there some, some of this? I like you. So oh, thank you, thank you. Right back at you. Was well, some of this could possibly be motivated by sexuality? Couldn't it? Am I reading too much into it? What do you mean, sexuality? Well, maybe you know. A lot of times, if you've got a woman who dresses as a man, they might be interested in women in a, in a way. Possibly is that the case here? Oh, look. Who knows what her sexual proclivities were? Yeah. Um, you know, some, the, the, the gay community embraces her. So does the Western community, the straight Western community. Um, the stagecoach drivers still love her. Yeah, well, of course. I mean, <laughs> um, but I was going to say, um, you, there's well, no way to tell documented wise what, what she was interested in that that's not been written about. We Nobody don't knows. know, but, yeah. but, you know, I do have a woman who's in love with her in the book. So who he actually lives with her. Oh. Um, so um, and is in to- totally in love with her and has no idea her sexuality. I mean, her, that she's a woman. Um, and, you know, she killed the famous outlaw Sugarfoot, who robbed a stagecoach one too many times. Yeah. Um, and uh, I have her have a, an incredible love affair. I'm not going to say with whom. Um, and she also was the first woman to vote in America as a man. So she voted for uh, uh, General Grant. She did for U.S. Grant. Yes. And and what's interesting is General. This is weird. General Grant died of tongue cancer from too many cigars and too much liquor. Yeah. And chewing tobacco, and yeah. so did Charlie Parkhurst. He, she, he died of the same thing from too much liquor, too much tobacco, chewing tobacco, and too many cigars. She loved cigars. See, that, uh, to me, uh, call me a prude all you want, Karen, that's not very ladylike. Yeah, well, listen, there were a couple of ladies I did research on who fought in the Civil War as really? men. Really? Confederate side, and then went home and had three children. <laughs> This is true. You can look it up. That's amazing to me. Oh, my God. They were, you know, they were, and the guys didn't even find out. I mean, they, I don't know how, look, the thing that interested me was I thought to myself, obviously a woman doesn't have a beard. Right. Um, and, or an Adam's apple. Right. So, so when I was doing research, I found out that most of these stagecoach drivers had the filthiest faces only because they were out there on the coach, top coach, and, you know, what? of course you'd get dirty. So I sort of fantasized that every morning her, her, her dress, was she'd put on her clothes, and then she'd go out into the garden and put dirt all over her face. <laughs> um, and, you know, then I had to figure out how she did get away with doing things like, you know, peeing and things. Yeah. I mean, that interests me. I mean, isn't it true that the astronauts, all of us go like, hmm, how did they do it? In their suit. <laughs> they do. Well, that, yeah, pr- I think that's actually true. That is how they do it. That's what kept yeah. me out of being an astronaut. I don't want to go to the bathroom in my suit. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, I had to find all these funny questions, figure it out. And, you know, it's if this was not true... I mean, it would be, as they say, as Mark Twain said, stranger, stranger than fiction. Yes. I mean, you know, it's it, it's um, it's just a bizarre story. But there were many women like her. I mean, I found out a bunch of women. See now, to, oh, you know what? Do me a favor. S- stay where you are. Uh, Karen Kardashian is my guest. She has written a book called The Whip. It tells the story of Charlotte Charlie Parkhurst who we believe is the first woman to vote, although, like I like to say, there was a catch. Uh, We'll tell you more in just a moment. It's WGN. It's Bill Leff on WGN, along with Karen Condasian. She has written a book called The Whip. It tells you about Charlotte Charlie Parker, who lived in the Old West as a man, but guess what? Wasn't a man. It was a woman, the first woman to vote. She, uh, the, the title, Karen, comes from when we say the whip, that was kind of the slang for the, the guys, mostly the guys who rode on these Wells Fargo wagons. They were yeah, referred to as whips. The whip. Yeah. What yeah. a stagecoach driver was called. Now, we're, we're trying to figure out how nobody knew uh, over all those years how somebody could pass themselves off as a man who was a woman. 
they drove primarily alone, didn't they? Was that a team thing or just a solo thing when you drove these Wells Fargo wagons? It depended what, what you were driving. Um, if you were driving, well, if you're driving a short distance, usually you were alone up there. And there would be somebody sitting in the, in the guest of honor seat. Um, but if you were carrying gold or you were on a long uh, route, meaning you were going from, you know, uh, you were overnighting it. Yeah. Um, you had someone, particularly if there was gold, you had, you know, the, the guy on the other side with his shotgun. Yep. Yeah. Um, in the shotgun seat. And um, so, um, y- you know, it was, a, it was a tough, tough thing to do. And you had to be, you didn't have to be strong, but you had to be really good with horses. And, you know, they handled six and eight reins. Rain, in the book, I describe it almost like playing the piano. Because each horse has its own, and there were eight, eight teams, eight horses. Um, so... Imagine trying to handle eight horses um, at the same time. Uh, I can't. Six, eight horses, you know. Uh, can we talk about you for just a second? Because you're, you sure. have quite a history behind you, Karen. Uh, let's start out with at the age of eight, you were a guest on Art Linkletter's show, Kids Say the Darndest Things. Do you remember much from that day? I don't remember it wholly, but yeah, I do remember it. What was that like? Well, I did it several times. Oh, you did? Yeah. Why? Because, first of all, um, they came to our school, and they interviewed children. And the more eccentric you were, the better. Yeah. And the more outspoken you were, the better. So there I was on the air with Art Dinkletter, and he asked me, he said, you know, what do you want to be? And I said, well... I wanted to be a spy, but now I want to be an actress because I get to miss school and I get all the free grilled cheese sandwiches and orange sherbet I want because they fed us before every show. Yeah. And so that was my, I said, I'm going to do that at eight years old. I made the decision on the air. And, and he, he looked at me, oh, okay, fine. But do you know that? I never wavered. How about that? And on, that was my mission. So it's strange, you know, because kids, you know, they want to be this and they want to be that, and they're constantly changing. I mean, it was all about food and missing school. Sure. What's no better than that? Wasn't he a master? Wasn't Art Linkletter a master at just setting somebody up, in his case, kids, letting them get the laugh, and then Art Linkletter would just do a take to the audience what would get an oh, even bigger God. laugh? Oh, God, yes. And he was also, um, he was, you know, he was really... Um, a kind of kid himself. Sure. Mischievous. Yeah. And so, you know, you could see that twinkle in his eye. So it wasn't like really a grown-up. Oh, yeah, I mean, he was a grown-up, and we knew he was, like, important. But it was like he had that twinkle. And so it's like he allowed us to be as naughty as we wanted to be. <laughs> you know, he encouraged the naughtiness, <laughs> which, which you know, I have then perpetrated the rest of my life. <laughs> well, I have I, been as naughty and as re- rebellious as, as, as you could get. <laughs> I seem to remember from watching him when I was a kid that he was a master at getting the kid to say things about his or her parents to really incriminate them. And he enjoyed yes. that immensely, didn't he? Oh, to his favorite thing. Yeah. yeah. You know, to talk about and, and little... Uh, from a little child's innocent point of view about what mommy and daddy do in the other room (laughs) and these funny noises that they make. Yeah, and that was very racy for the late 50s and early 60s. Oh, my God. Turn that on because they never knew what they were going to hear. Do me a favor. Uh, I only have a minute with you, but I'm so curious about this. You became friends with the the great Tennessee Williams. What was that that like? That must have been phenomenal. Well, he came to see him in a play, one of his plays, The Rose Tattoo, and he loved it, and we became friends, and after that, he gave me the rights to all his plays. Wow. He was alive, and I produced a play called Sweet Bird of Youth with the great Ed Harris, Yeah, who was still a friend, um, and um, as the, it, it was amazing. To answer your question, he taught me, he, he as a writer taught me more about acting than, than, than a- any great acting teacher I've had. Um, and he was so funny and outrageous. And he's the one who really made me understand that you have to be yourself and you can't care about what other people think. Oh, he's right. You know, you have to just open your heart and also be a good person. Yep. 
at the same time. I don't mean hurting people on purpose, but I'm talking about, you know, saying your truth, which is not necessarily the truth, but it is your truth. And and he taught me that. It's um, a valuable lesson, isn't it? What? It's a very valuable lesson. It's a bit, and you know, and he told me all about his crazy characters too, you know, which was fabulous. Um, but yeah, I'm very blessed and have played most of his women. Yeah, wow, what, what what a talented writer he was, and what a talented writer you are, Karen. I I urge everybody to pick up Karen's book, The Whip. It is the story of Charlotte Charlie Parkhurst, uh, who has uh, an incredible story of her own to tell, and, and and it's also available on tape, narrated by Robin Weigert from uh, from Deadwood. Karen, it's on it was Amazon, great. by the way. It's on Amazon. Yeah. yeah, it's on Amazon. It's on Barnes and Noble, and also if you want to look up on my website, you can do my last name which is K-O-N-D-A-Z-I-A-N.com, Kandasian.com. I'm they, Armenian. They should have, I know, I, you know, it's funny, I said to my producer, this is the first Armenian guest we've had all year, so finally we get an Armenian on the show. Oh, who's doing a Western instead of a genocide Isn't movie. that crazy? Isn't of that course. crazy? You know, most, most Armenians write about our Armenian genocide, <laughs> you know. <laughs> Karen. I mean, you are fabulous. Oh, that's nice of you. Thank you very much. It was so great it's to nice meet you. Lunch. <laughs> Whenever you want, you just say the word. Stick around, everybody. We got a lot more coming up. It's Bill Left with you on WGN.